Advent is the start of the Christian year, and it is a season of preparation and anticipation. To be sure, the word Advent actually means coming. And so it is during these four weeks that we anticipate the coming of Christ. We recognize that coming in the Incarnation, when God became man and became one of us, entrusting his very self into our care. This is a joyous occasion. As you well know, the birth of a baby is something we can delight to look forward to. And so it's a little disjointed, a little unsettling, that in the weeks leading up to the Incarnation, the celebration of the Incarnation, we have these readings that are about the end times when the sky is darkened and you can't even see the moon and everything is disrupted and people are disoriented. And here we hear in our gospel lesson this morning Jesus telling the listeners, keep awake, keep awake. We can feel the urgency and it does not sit right with this anticipation of a coming baby. When in the season of Advent, we read from the prophets, and prophets always call us into repentance. They call us to repent. They call us to turn from our evil ways and to live. That is their invitation because it is in the turning that we come back into life. And so I thought during these weeks, as we anticipate Christmas and the celebration of the Incarnation, I would invite us to consider what it is we are turning from and what it is we are turning to. On each week, I will take up a particular theme as we often reflect on in Advent. This week, I'll talk about hope. Next week, I'll talk about peace. The third week, I'll talk about joy. And the fourth week, I'll talk about love. Hope. That is today's theme, and it calls us to question what is it we're turning toward? And what is it we're turning away from? We are asked to repent. Repent from cynicism. Repent from skepticism. Repent from doubt. Repent from impatience. For all of these things, when we cling to them, diminish our commitment to hope. They cloud our vision of what it means to hope. But what does it mean to repent from these things? Cynicism is the inclination to believe that it can't be done because it's never been done, and why would anyone be motivated unless it is in their best interest? The promised future has to have something in it for me. And we can feel tempted as we read these lessons today to think about it on a personal nature. We might say, what's in it for me in this coming of the Christ? Indeed, Jesus does tell his listeners what's in it for them, and also what's in it for them if they don't. But then we can be tempted into doubt. To say, really, is this for true, for real? We might have a lack of uncertainty, or we might have a feeling of uncertainty and a lack of conviction. I mean, is it really going to be like that? Is it really going to be like that in the end? And is what's promised really what I really want? We may be tempted towards skepticism, a philosophy with the theory that certain knowledge is impossible. So we might say, no one can ever really know what the end times are going to be like anyway. And then we may be tempted toward impatience, a restlessness under delay, an eager desirousness. I find that impatience is the one thing that trips me up most often. Cynthia Brugol, in her book, Mystical Hope, Trusting in the Mercy of God, this little bitty book, invites us to consider what it means to hope. She points out that frequently we think of hope as something that's on the horizon, something that we can look out and see, and I dare say, more often than not, that's how we envision it. We have hope when we can see a point out there to which we would like to go, and we can imagine ourselves getting there. Hope, in this way, comes from an ordinary awareness, an ability to see what's around us. It is grounded in our egoic thinking. We notice the differences, and we draw dis distinctions, and that's how we can clarify the hope. Not this, but that. Not those, but these. That is the egoic 
thinking. In Cynthia's little book, she loves us into discovering our egoic selves. She reminds us that we are self-reflective, that we, of all creatures, have a self-reflective consciousness. And as far as we understand, we're the only part of creation that does. We have the ability to look at ourselves from the outside and to see what we see and to consider ourselves from that external viewpoint. Some examples, she says, of our understanding ourselves from outside of ourselves is to say things like, I'm a person who loves the ocean, or I have a quick temper, or I'm a cat person, or a dog person, or an introvert, or a person who needs order in her life. These are egoic ways of understanding ourselves. Looking from a self-reflective consciousness, we can say, see me, this is me. This ability to be self-reflective is a double-edged sword because the ego is chronically anxious. And as she writes in her little book, the ego, we simply can't get enough. We can't get enough praise or enough security or enough accomplishment to overcome that dreadful sense of being separate and separated, of having secretly failed at the mission of bringing ourself into fullness. This egoic way of understanding, of thinking, she describes in an analogy in her own life of sailing. She writes this in her little book. On a bright sunny day, you can set your course on a landfall five miles away from you and sail right to it. But in the fog, you make your way by paying close attention to all the things immediately around you. The deep roll of the sea swells as you enter open ocean, the pungent scent of spruce boughs, or the livelier tempos of the waves as you approach the land. You find your way by being sensitively and sensuously connected to exactly where you are, by letting here reach out and lead you. You will not learn this in the navigation course, of course, but it is a part of the local knowledge that all the fishermen and natives use to steer by. You know you belong to a place when you can find your way home by feel. And this is the contrast to the egoic thinking. Egoic thinking helps you find yourself, you reference yourself to where you are not, by what is out there, where it is you want to go. But in contrast, the thinking that she directs our attention to in the sailboat in the fog is a spiritual awareness, a reference to where you are, knowing on a more visceral level that allows you to pick up on a level of awareness that doesn't show up on the ordinary thinking level of knowing. She goes on to say, the point is that our spiritual awareness seems to be given to us in order to hone in on and not lose touch with that point or spark of pure truth at the core of our being, from which both the true compass, track of our life, and our existential conviction of belonging emanate. That is what the magnetic pull is all about. And as we learn gradually to trust it and to let it draw us along, we discover that those core fears of the egoic level, that something terrible can happen to us, that we can fall out of God or suffer irreparable harm, those things, they do not compute in these deeper waters of our being. Try as we will, we simply cannot find them there. They can only affect us when we are at the surface of ourselves. Advent gives us the chance to ask two questions. How do we learn to listen for this honing capacity? How do we stop so that we can see where the compass pulls north and reorient ourselves accordingly? In her little book, Cynthia encourages us into meditation she reminds us of metanoia, which I found the most satisfied way of description on the Wikipedia page. 
So I'll read, to it, read from it to you here. Metanoia is a transliteration of the Greek, which means afterthought or beyond thought. With meta, meaning after or beyond, as in metaphysics. And nous, meaning mind, as in paranoia. It's commonly understood as a transformative change of heart, especially a spiritual conversion. The terms suggest repudiation, change of mind, repentance, and atonement, but conversion and reformation may best approximate its connotation. Thomas Keating, an American Catholic monk and priest in the order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance, discovered, if you will, and most aptly conveyed to the world back in the 70s, a practice of centering prayer. Thomas Keating developed a way of teaching people how to pray, centering prayer, the word itself reminding us of the honing in, of the going deep, of getting beyond the surface which is inside, going deep into the foundation from which we've come to know ourselves most deeply. Centering prayer. It centers us. In practice, for those of you who've never done it before, you sit in 20 minutes of silence. Yes, 20 minutes. It's a very long time for the novice. But you find yourself growing into it in time, and you're meant to have a spirit of compassion. So if you, like a young child, grow restless at 10 minutes, give yourself a break and stand up and be finished. But the invitation is to be quiet to allow ourselves to be still and know that God is. To put to rest the surface concerns of our lives, those things our ego calls us to pay attention to, that demand us to orient ourselves to the ways of the world, all that we see out there around us. Centering prayer pulls in and says, shh, let it be. In Keating's teaching, he died in 2018, but for what, 40-some years. He taught people how to practice centering prayer. And he would invite people to, take, to choose a word, a word that will call them back into the quietness. Now, this word is not supposed to repeated, be repeated over and over. It's not a mantra, but is a centering word. It's one that brings us back to the center. Often people choose a word that feels most accessible to them, most available, peace, love, hope. And as you sit in silence, you allow yourself to sit. When a word comes into your head, you let it flow right by. When I was taught this, it was, the example was given as a log on a river. You notice it and it goes on by, downstream. Don't cling to the thought. Allow them to float. And if for some reason there becomes some sort of log jam in your brain, you return to that word which will, un, which will loosen it and give you that place of quietness and centering again. A story that I heard Thomas Keating tell and which Cynthia Bourgeois tells in her own book is of a nun who was learning this for the first time. And she said to Thomas at the conclusion of their prayer time, I am no good at this. I had 10,000 thoughts that flooded my mind. And Thomas Keating, with his compassionate and joyful smile, said, Wonderful, 10,000 times to return to God. Indeed, my friends, this is what we're invited into. This is what I invite you into during this Advent season. Advent word can be an opportunity for practicing exactly this. Every day there'll be a word. Practice sitting in meditative silence, quieting your mind, allowing yourself to rest so that you can hear the deeper voice that is within you, what God is speaking in and through you from the depths of creation, from the expansiveness of time. And if you want, you can return to that Advent word when your mind becomes jammed with the thoughts of the day. I believe that this is what Jesus is calling us to in our gospel today. This is what he means in being awake. It is not an egoic sense where we have to put little splinters in our eyes or toothpicks or tape our eyelashes up to our eyebrows in hopes that we will not fall asleep. 
It is not anxious and restless. It is not fearful. It is a deep knowing of what to pay attention to. It is awakeness that can hear the smallest sound in the quiet, then can recognize a name throughout all the other sounds. And in that we learn to respond. We are awake in our attentiveness and our awareness. This is what we are invited into as the body of Christ. For the body of Christ is God's hope in the world. Years ago, a couple of years ago actually, I had the privilege of attending worship at the church where the Reverend Dr. William Barber pastors in Eastern North Carolina. I was among his congregation, a gathering of a faithful group. It was not the thousands and thousands that you might expect from his national um, profile. It was a community of believers who had driven just from up the street or around the bend to come together to worship week in and week out. One of the things that he said in worship that I still carry with me is a reminder to the congregation present of the significance of the church, that we are God's hope, that we embody the hope of God in Christ, that our hope is not something that we can proclaim because it's been achieved. It's not something that we can tell everyone because it's been accomplished. The hope comes from because God has entrusted God's self into our care asking us to participate in the proclamation of the good news, and it's God's promise to us that gives us hope. We are the ones that come together week in and week out, the universal church, to remember the hope of God in us. We encourage one another in practices that center us in our identity as children of God so that we might recognize ourselves when we go out into the world. And when people say to us, oh, are you a cat person or a dog person? Are you an introvert? Are you someone who needs to have order in her life? We can say, maybe yes, maybe no. But who I definitely know myself to be is a child of God. And I can hear my name when God calls it. That is the awake that we are called into this Advent season. Amen.